At the 48th Phyllis Schlafly Eagle Council, we sat down with Walkaway Movement founder, Brandon Strock. Brandon Strock, wonderful to have you back on American Thought Leaders. Thank you, great to be back. So, you know, you've been doing all this remarkable work, um, specifically with groups that, uh, let's say, are expected to think a particular way along right. prescribed so let's call them narratives or trains of thought and so forth. And you've been, as far as I can tell, your whole project is to try to offer different ways of thinking. Right. Right. Well, I want to connect with different communities that I feel like are only receiving one message from one party. Uh, the one thing that the Democrats have done extremely well, I think, is marketing themselves toward minority groups and various classes of people, which sort of fall into this sort of victim narr narrative, the victim classes of people. And the Republican Party has failed greatly at connecting with these, or even really <laughs> attempting to connect with these various communities. And so I, I looked at what was happening when I had my own walk away moment back in 2017, and I thought to myself, if more people on the left knew what I now know from what I've discovered from sort of researching conservatism, what it means to be a conservative, and debunking a lot of the narratives that the media puts out, the liberal media, about what Republicans are, who they are, and what they're not. And um, if these people knew what I knew, they wouldn't have such a fear of the Republican Party. They wouldn't reject and be so opposed to the Republican Party. All it really takes, I think, are people taking the time and energy and effort to go in and have conversations with these various communities. And the Republicans are just not doing that. So um, that's something that I thought should be a mission and part of the effort of Walk Away is to go in and talk to the black community, the Hispanic community, the LGBT community, uh, the, the Jewish community, all of these different groups that are voting Democrat in these enormous blocks and sort of clear up a lot of the misperceptions of what it means to be a conservative and a Republican. Well, so what kind of conversations are you typically having? I know you've had a number of these town halls mm -hmm. recently with, again, a range of groups. What, is, what are some of the themes of, that people are curious about? And I, I mean, I, I want to actually know, I, people are coming to these events. Yes. Um, how, how is this all playing out? So, I mean, what we hear a lot when it comes to, say, racial minorities that, is that a lot of this is generational. Mm -hmm. um, my mother voted Democrat, my grandmother voted Democrat, my parents, my grandparents. It just didn't really occur to me that there was any other way. So if you're talking about a, like a racial minority group or something like that, what we find is that um, a lot of people, just based off of their, you know, their familial uh, allegiance to the Democrat Party or you know, their, where they grew up, that it, it's hard to break free from and do something and think differently than all of those around you. I mean, I, I know this myself because I had that experience. And believe me, I actually went through a phase early on when I was waking up where I considered just staying a liberal because I was like, it's going to be so hard to change. I, you know, I'm gonna, I know I'm going to lose friends. I know I'm going to lose family. Uh, it's going to severely curb a lot of job opportunities for me and various things. And is it worth it? Is it worth it to live my truth? Now, I had the luxury, and I'm sure people will think this is odd that I'm saying this, but I had the luxury of already going through this as a gay man. And I know that you, no person can be happy if they're not living authentically and if they're not really living their truth. And so for me, it wasn't even an option. I knew I had to walk away. But I, I have an appreciation for those who you know, are in racial minority communities who want to think independently for themselves and do something different than their, their family did, their parents and grandparents, right. etc. So, I mean, for, for many people, it's just a matter of going in, having these conversations and say, look, you're not alone. You, you have a choice here and you don't have to do the same things that your parents and grandparents did or that all of your friends are doing. There are a lot of other people just like you who are also thinking for themselves and making their own decisions. And then if you look at something like the LGBT community, it's obviously not familial, it's more um, media. I mean, it's, it's a manipulation of truth that's coming from the media because okay. the media wants LGBT people to believe constantly that they're in danger, that the Republican Party uh, wishes to take all their rights away and do them harm. And some will even say that we have the most anti-LGBT president in office that has ever existed. None of these things are true anymore. Now, emphasis on the word anymore. I think that the Republican Party 
screwed up badly in the past with the way the stances that they took on certain gay issues, uh, on uh, gay rights, and. Um, but I don't think that that's where we are today. And if it was where we were today, I wouldn't be doing this. I wouldn't be supporting the Republican Party. I wouldn't be, you know, uh, encouraging other LGBT people to walk away. But I want them to see that what the media is telling them is a fabrication of reality and where we are in 2019 and that you have a choice. The choice is up to you. You have the choice to be a full participant in the American political experience. You don't have to be a Democrat just because you're LGBT. So how do these town halls work? Can you just give me an overview? Like, what, what, how does the interaction typically sure. take place? So what we're typically trying to do is to go directly into the heart of a lot of these communities. I mean, we're limited, obviously, by the amount of funding that we have and the amount of work that we can actually do. If we had limitless funding, we'd be doing 20 town halls a month around the country. Uh, but So we have to be a little bit um, selective at this point of where we choose to go and at what time. But we're typically trying to go right into the heart of various communities. For instance, I live in New York City. I live in Harlem, and I have for years. And so I thought, well, why don't we launch the first Black Americans Town Hall right here in my own neighborhood in Harlem? And so um, with the Walk Away campaign, it started out as a testimonial campaign, telling uh, people, uh, submitting their written and video testimonials about why they're walking away. And so we took I shouldn't say we, I, don't, I shouldn't take the credit for this because it's too good, but there's a gentleman in the walkway campaign named Mike Boss. He's a Hollywood uh, filmmaker and he's brilliant. And he, he took the testimonials of 20 black Americans and like a puzzle, he took pieces of them and created one beautiful, what we call a documonial, a testimonial documentary short film right, about black people walking away. So in Harlem, when we launched the first Black Americans Town Hall, we rented out a theater in the Magic Johnson Theater in uh, AMC in Harlem. Uh, we raised the money so that people could come entirely for free, and I literally canvassed my neighborhood in Harlem, handing out invitations and interviewing people on the street and saying, do you feel like it's time for a change in the black community? Do you think the Democrats have served your community well? What I overwhelmingly heard from people is, I don't really think so. Now that I think about it, I'm interested in finding out what other options are. Haven't thought about this, haven't revisited this conversation in a while. So we brought people into the theater, we screened the 35 minute short film for free, and then we had a panel discussion uh, with five or six really strong, great voices in the black community who've either walked away or were always conservatives, just addressing the audience and saying, look, this is why I think that it's time to rethink the way that we're voting and have been traditionally voting for a long, long time. And what I think is so great about what we do is that it is a town hall. We don't get people in a room and lecture them or make them attend a seminar or a rally where we say, this is why what we believe is great, now everyone go home. We want to hear from you. If you disagree with what we think, stand up and say so. Argue back, debate, ask questions. Let us have it if you want to let us have it. You, the people who attend our events have just as much voice as the people on the panels. And so I think that's what makes it a really great, robust discussion is that you know if you really feel strongly that the Democrat Party is so great for you and so great for your community, talk about it. Let's hear it and let's have that discussion back and forth. And very, very interesting. Thank you. <laughs> and so, what the the most recent ones? You know, you've had several. I, I've been yes. seeing your videos popping up in my feeds and mm -hmm. so forth. So, what there was a, you said there was an LGBTQ one. There's we've done three LGBT. Um, we're just about to do our third Black Americans Town Hall in Atlanta. That's literally coming up in like three or four days. I'm going straight from this to that. Um, we're about to do our very first, I don't know when this is coming out, so the, we may have already done it by the time people see this, but we'll be doing our very first Hispanic Americans Town Hall, okay. also in New York City. We're gonna launch that in AOC's district, District 14 of New York. So we're gonna go straight into where her constituency is and assemble a really amazing uh, Hispanic Latino panel of voices, uh, again, walkaways and conservatives, addressing that community. And just uh, talking to, in this, in this case, her constituency, and saying, um, look, you're supporting these candidates who really are not acting in the best interest of your community, and this party is not acting in the best interest of your community. I mean, AOC herself just cost that community, her, her constituency, 22,000 jobs by killing the Amazon deal and so many other things. And yet, again, on the opposite side, we have the Republican Party not even communicating with them, not even saying to them, hey, there's an alternative here. You don't have to support this person who just killed tens of thousands of jobs for your children and grandchildren. So we want to go in and have that conversation.
Okay, so you've experienced some resistance or some uh, <laughs> uh, interference with your attempts, I, I know, and is this... Is what a nice word. <laughs> Yes, and this is continuing, presumably. Like, mm -hmm. how how are you? What 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 have you experienced uh, lately? I've, I've you know I talked with uh, a few people this weekend. About, yes, about these kinds of things. Well, the LGBT resistance has easily been the worst. Um, we have had two of our three LGBT events cancelled. Uh, one of them in less than 24 hours before the event itself. Uh, the first one that we launched was in New York City. Right. Um, it was between you, me, and Jesus. It was an honest to God, good faith effort that I was putting forward to have a conversation with my own community about why I thought we should reconsider our allegiance to the Democratic Party. I uh, petitioned the uh, LGBT Center of New York City to let us host the event. I told them exactly who we were, what we were doing, what the nature of the event was. They went, they agreed with all of it. We signed contracts, we paid for the venue, we, we spent a lot of money on marketing and whatnot, and then days before the event, we found out not through a phone call, not through an email, but through a public post on Twitter that our event had been canceled and we were labeled Nazis, racists, a hate group. Uh, they slandered everybody on the panel. That was the first example. Uh, we didn't have much trouble in Los Angeles, thank goodness, that was a really great event. And then next we went to Chicago and I would say that was the worst one because None of us live in Chicago. We were all strangers in a strange town. Just showing up, spent a lot of money to fly the crew out there and to do the event. And these events cost a lot of money. We have to hire security, we have to pay for the venues, and we have to do the marketing. And we're not, you know, Walk Away is a grassroots organization. We're not funded by millionaires and billionaires. We're funded by hardworking American people who want to change the, the country and the culture for the better. And so we went to Chicago to have this event. We did a walkthrough of the venue the day before. Um, we caught a pretty hostile tone from the people giving us the walkthrough and thought it was very strange. But I asked him point blank, I said, is there any chance you're gonna cancel my event? I feel a little weird about this. And he was like, absolutely not. No, 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 we, we're good. And then um, at about 6 or 7 p.m. that night, we got a phone call from them saying, uh, you're canceled, we're not doing your event, we've done some research on you. Less than 24 hours before the event, we've done some research on you, and we, um, we've come to the conclusion that you are a hate group and that we don't support the speech that you're putting forward. Your event is canceled. So there we were with um, about 300 people registered to come to our event, less than 24 hours in a city that we don't know, we don't know anyone, we don't know any other venues that we could talk to. But luckily I have the hardest working team in the country. Um, I'm very blessed to have such amazing individuals who have stepped up and sacrificed time from their, their children and their families and their jobs to support Walk Away. And my team worked triple time and we found a beautiful new venue and the, the event did go off uh, as a total success. And we did have that co uh, conversation with the LGBT community and it was fantastic. Very, very, very interesting. Thank and you. So you're um, how are, do you expect that this might change uh, anytime sooner? Is this the kind of, is this, is, is this just, yeah, is this just going to be part of the course going forward? Um, I, we're always cognizant that this may be an obstacle that we have to face. We've started taking measures now to try to prevent certain things from happening before we get to that point, trying to put no cancellation clauses into our contracts, and just being very upfront with people and saying, look, this is... This is what they're gonna say? Or yeah. yeah, well, and here's the thing. Now at this point, we have several of these events under our belt, and we, we hire a camera crew, uh, amazing guys, uh, to come and do these events. They film it beautifully, they do beautiful sound, they edit it, and we put this out. So we've got several of these events on YouTube that people can watch for free. And this was what was so interesting about the Chicago thing when they were coming after us and saying, oh, we've researched you and we think you're a hate group. We said, we've already done two of these already. Just go on YouTube and watch them. All you have to do is watch. You can see for yourself the very language that we're about to engage in tomorrow in your venue. We don't want to watch it. We're not going to watch it. We've read, we, we, we believe what we want to believe. We've read what you know we think and, and that's it. I mean, they didn't want to see it, but this is what has been so absolutely sort of gobsmacking about this whole thing is like, well, all you have to do is watch the events we've already done and you'll know exactly what you're going to get from us.
Oh, very, very interesting. Yeah. So this is a, you know, basically a, a, a constant new adventure every time you're trying to do one of these. <laughs> yes, I mean, it, it's not for the faint of heart, for sure. Um, and but we all kind of know what we've signed up for and what we're getting into. Um, for me, I'm actually not one of those people who likes when our events get canceled. I think that there are those people who's like, ah, yes, this makes great headlines. Um, you know, it kind of gets people rallying behind you. We legitimately want to have the conversation. We legitimately want to make the change. Uh, so for us, it's devastating when our events get canceled because that means that's 150, 200, 250 less people who are going to get our message if this event doesn't happen. And then, of course, like I said, we also record the event and put it out, so that's thousands more people who will watch it on YouTube or social media. Um, I don't want our events to get canceled. I want to have the conversations. What are the key misconceptions in your mind, the most common ones that you're seeing uh, that among people? Well, about Walkaway or about me? No, about <laughs> no. The, uh, that's a great question. Not not about Walkaway, not about you, but the misconceptions that you're trying to rectify oh. in the people that come. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, it, it's there's going to be no surprise here. Donald Trump's a racist. Uh, Donald Trump is a bigot. Republicans are terrible people. Republicans hate black people, uh, brown people, LGBT people. How could you possibly support uh, a party that's so hateful and bigoted? Um, and it's, it's all of that. I mean, it's this, we hear the same things that all of us hear every day, on the street, in the news. Um, you know, the Democratic debates, the third round, was just the other night. And it's absolutely astonishing slash horrifying that they're now engaging in this language, both the candidates and the people throwing the, the holding the, hosting the debate, they just ask questions now like, given that Donald Trump is a racist, what do you, you know, it's, <laughs> they don't ask questions like, is it possible that this policy could be construed as racist or what do you think about this? It is, you know, Donald Trump is a bigot. How are we going to overcome dot, dot, dot? So, I mean, when such definitive statements are being made now, we're not, they're not even questioning it. I mean, they're just literally putting it out. That's, these are the facts. We have a, a, you know, a Nazi in the White House. We have a white supremacist. The questions at the debate the other night, I mean, like two-thirds of the questions were, given the rise in white supremacy in the United States right now, meanwhile, it's like the, the Klan has like a handful of people at this point, but the media, of course, is running out and putting them on camera every chance that they get and being like, look at the rise, look at the rise. There's no rise in white supremacy in this country. But this is what they've done to people's minds. They've made people believe that uh, hate and hate crimes are becoming a, an increasingly prevalent problem in this country. And these are the types of questions that we're hearing from people at these events. How could you support anyone but the Democrats, because the Democrats are the only people that care about people of color, marginalized people, LGBT people. And so we have to, we have a couple of jobs to do. We have to create, uh, we have to uh, uh, combat that narrative, but we also have to correct all of the fallacies that the liberal media is, is planting into people's minds and making them believe. So you see this as, is it, trying to offer a counter narrative or is it trying to help people think for themselves better well it's both yeah. I, I mean you this the the latter is accomplished by successfully accomplishing the former I mean if you if you can correct a narrative that somebody believes because Don Lemon or Rachel Maddow or Anderson Cooper told them repeatedly Russian inclusion's real, Russian inclusion's real, the president's a racist, the president's a bigot. And then you can get them to see, like, look, they manipulated you. These things are not real, these are not truthful things. If you can get people to start considering, oh my God, I, right. I think I was manipulated by the media, that is the catalyst to getting people to start asking more questions. Like your own concerned. story. That is exactly what happened to me. Right. So how's the media response been to all of this? Well, uh, it, obviously it depends on which side of the media we're talking about because it's, let's face it, we're not living in a time of great objectivity with a lot of the journalists in America at this time. I mean, um, some, of, some of the media has actively been participants in trying to slander us, attack us, you know, uh, be a part of uh, continuing the narratives about us which have allowed certain venues to, to cancel us, which of, of course is terrible. Um, 
and you know, and then we're extremely grateful, I think, for you know the more the actual journalists who are actually objective and actually doing their job. And to be honest with you, the Epic Times has been um, a source that we've been incredibly grateful for and appreciative towards because we've gotten a really fair representation from you guys. I mean, I feel like yeah, you. You guys ask us tough questions, and you, you you definitely, I think, get to the bottom of what it is that's going on and what we're doing. Uh, but you've, at the same time, supported us in a way by just simply telling the truth about what it is that we're doing. And it's interesting because I've actually noticed that some of the same, the very same sources who have attacked me, have attacked the Epoch Times, and um, I've even seen. Things that have insinuated that uh, they're anti-gay things and, and homophobic, and I just want to say that that's certainly never been my experience with the Epic Times, and I've uh, we've been nothing but grateful that you guys have been so fair, I think, and 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 so in that way so good to us, and so that is an absolute fallacy that uh, you know I would like to to correct right now because um, I've had a very good relationship with you and I appreciate how good you've been to us. So thank you. Really, really appreciate you saying yeah. that. Yeah. And how about anything you'd like to t say to our audience, a shout out? Absolutely. Uh, I think the world of the Epoch Times, I want to say thank you guys so much for the coverage that you've given us, for the, the support that you've given us by, by covering our events and giving us just really, really honest representation in the media and to your, to your viewers and your fans and to the people who follow the Epoch Times. Thank you all so much. These, this is a really, really great organization and we need to support great organizations like the Epoch Times who have a real quest for giving truthful information to the American people, something that is so lacking today. Let's continue to support news organizations like this. We need it so badly in this country. Brandon, thank you so much. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate that.